we are talking about what it means to be a disciple. And this is a perfect weekend for this video because I like being in a place where there's four real seasons and we're in the middle of the cold one. And here's a reminder that there's that miracle of spring that's coming. Watch this. parts to that picture of a seed and going into the ground and it coming into life. And in this picture, we're like the dirt. <laughs> we can't grow anything in and of ourselves, but God says he puts the seed of his word into us and it brings new life. And I, I love the way that it's in an insore environment, so that's not wind. It, the plant dances as it grows. And as the roots go deeper, the plant can go higher. And we looked for a video that would actually go all the way, but they all think two weeks or four weeks or six weeks is enough because you don't get any fruit till you get about three months in. And of course, the purpose of a bean plant is not just to look pretty. The purpose of a bean plant is to produce beans. And so we want to talk about what does it mean when the Bible says that we are called to be disciples? And what does it mean when it says that we are called to make disciples? Because it's easy for you to say, well, I kind of know what that means. But we were actually challenged by a group that came for a seminar. And they, they said to us as a group, I want you to write down the definition of what is a disciple. And of course, we got all kinds of things like believe in Jesus and follow Jesus and believe in the resurrection and somebody that reads your Bible and somebody that is trying to share their faith. And, and all of those were good things, but... When we collected our group's wisdom, we had about 15 or 20 things. And one of the things they challenged us with was everybody in your church needs to have a simple, concise definition of what it means to be a disciple. Other than that, how do you ever know if you are one and how do you know if you're making one? And so we came up with a fairly clear and simple definition of what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Christ. And I also want to walk through what it means, and I want you to wrestle with the question of, am I a true disciple of Jesus, and am I in the business of helping make disciples as we walk through this? So we're going to hang all of that idea around this simple verse where Jesus goes up to Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, who are career fishermen on the Sea of Galilee, and we can tell from the Gospels that he's had some other contact with them. They know who Jesus is. He's not walking up cold. But at this time, he comes up to them and he is calling them to leave their nets, to continue, to discontinue that way of life, and to actually follow him. And as you know, they do in the Gospels for the next three years, they follow him. And so he says to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so we took that real simple statement and we said that's a great, simple way to think about this. That somebody who is a disciple is somebody who is following Jesus, somebody who is being changed by Jesus. He says, I will make you. 
and somebody who says, I'm on mission with Jesus. If any of those things are missing, then there's a question as to whether or not you are a real disciple. And so we're going to look at each one of those. What does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to be changed by Jesus? And what does it mean to be on mission with Jesus? So are you a follower of Jesus? We have a tendency to try to not use the word Christian because the word Christian often means so many things to so many people. It's gotten so watered down as to mean nothing. And so we'd say to people, are you a follower of Jesus? And if you remember a few years ago when Michael Phelps was blowing out everybody out of the water and getting all these gold medals, his fan base went crazy. Everybody thought this was an amazing thing, never been done before, and they were fans of Michael Phelps. But there was a few young guys and young girls that actually decided they want to get in the pool and start swimming laps so that someday they might be able to swim like Michael Phelps. And you see, there's a world of difference between a fan and a follower. And Jesus has lots of fans. Almost anybody you talk to, no matter what their religious background, they think Jesus is a pretty cool guy, and they think what he taught was pretty interesting. Usually they don't have an idea what he taught, but they think it's a, he was a good teacher. He was a good man, and that we should all love our neighbors and something, you know, general like that. But there's a difference between being a fan of Jesus and being a follower of Jesus. And in fact, Jesus had many, many people who came when he was here on this earth and they listened to his teachings or they saw him feed the 5,000 and they thought, man, this is a pretty good trick. We better be back to listen to Jesus about lunchtime again because he was doing amazing things and there was lots of people that were following his group. But Jesus kept saying things that were difficult because he was sifting people's hearts. And part of what he was doing, and I believe part of what he's still doing, is sifting the fans from the followers. And so he would say some hard things, and some people would leave. Like, oh, this is a little too extensive or a little too intensive for me. I'm out of here. And one of the things that Jesus said when he was describing what it meant to follow him, is a very powerful and very difficult verse from Luke chapter 9. Jesus said to them, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Sometimes when we talk to people about how cool it is to follow Jesus and what it means that he's given his life to save us from our sins, we may sometimes talk as though, man, this is the greatest deal ever. You should sign up and follow Jesus. It will make all your dreams come true. And while the following Jesus changes your whole life, and while Jesus is certainly the source of peace and hope and all of the things we most deeply need, there is a tough side that says, are you really willing to be a follower? And he breaks it down into those three statements, which is, ironically, he says several times in the Gospels, I, I'm guessing that he repeated this phrase a bunch of times. And then he puts down these three statements, and then he says, there's only two categories of people. There are people who are trying to hang on to their lives and save it for themselves, and he says, here's the spiritual truth. If you try to hang on and save your life for yourself, you will always lose it because you can't preserve your own life. And then he says, here's the other option. Whoever loses his life for my sake, that's the one that's going to find it. They're going to find true life, life eternal. That's the only two options that there are. And so let's look at what does that mean to deny myself, to take up the cross. And we just looked at that picture of the plant and the Spirit of God places the Word of God within us, and there is a miracle that happens in the fact that, that we come to believe that Jesus really is the truth and the way and the life. And so when that belief, when true saving faith comes, then new life comes within you, and, and you have a desire to want to do what God wants you to do and to, to begin to read the Bible and to begin to hang out with other Christians. But even though you have new life in you, 
never forget that you also have the old sinful self in you as well. And so part of following Jesus is recognizing that there's a part of you that's still a traitor to the old way. And in fact, it's very, very strong. Every morning we wake up full of ourselves. If you don't believe that, just try to wake somebody up an hour before they're supposed to get up. And we are very intent on making our life about us and making it making ourselves happy. And so part of following Jesus is to recognize that I am to deny myself, not my deepest self that's a follower of Jesus, but that surface sinful self, and I am to put God's interests in place instead of mine. Let me give you a simple illustration. Uh, this is a little embarrassing because several years ago I, I used this great illustration and I talked about how the fact that when I get up in the morning and I open my iPad, I like to have my devotions on my iPad. So I've got the version Bible right there. And sometimes I hit it first. And sometimes you hit the news, sometimes you check up on Facebook, sometimes you see what's happening with the weather. And, and so when I spoke publicly, I said, I think we need to start the morning and be the first icon you push, be you version. About six months later, Crystal, who works on staff, said, Paul, that was such a great idea. I've been doing that every day since then. And I thought, I was for a while. <laughs> I think that's still a great idea. But how easy it is to slide back in to doing what is selfish. And so Jesus said, part of denying Part of following him is to recognize that in following Jesus, you are saying yes to your truest self, but you are denying that selfish, sinful self, and it is strong and powerful within you. If you just do everything you feel like doing, <laughs> you will usually get in big trouble. If it feels good, be careful. And so he says, I want you to realize that part of it is denying myself. And then he goes even stronger with a huge statement that I think we often don't understand. He says, I, I want you to take up your cross daily. And boy, when people read that and see that, they often think, well, uh, take the cross like Jesus. Remember he's saying this to them before he died on the cross. So they weren't thinking about Jesus in the cross. They were thinking of the common cultural picture of crucifixion. And the the Romans used the most excruciating, shameful, slow, painful death possible because they wanted to make a point that nobody better do anything against the Roman might because this is what will happen. And so that the convicted person would have the cross beam of the cross that they had to carry. And they would take it from usually wherever the judgment hall was and they had to carry it through the streets so that everybody could see them and then they would go to a hill outside where they would be killed. So when somebody's taking their cross, what do you know about them? They are a dead person walking. Their life is over and it, it's this excruciating part that not only says, do I need to let Christ be the driver in my life? Somebody said, if Jesus is your co-pilot, you better change seats because that means I'm still trying to hang on to control. In fact, if you've noticed, when you're driving, when you turn sharply or brake a little quickly, you're perfectly fine. Have you noticed that your passenger makes funny noises? My mom always had a brake on the other side, it's like <clears throat> trying to push it. It never worked, but it never stopped her. And there's this tendency when you are not the driver and the car goes left, you go, <clears throat> Or maybe you're coming up too close to a car and you're stopping too short. It's like, it never does any good. But when you're not the driver, the changes of direction can feel kind of abrupt, can't they? And I believe one of the deepest things that we need to say about this phrase is that in following Jesus, there will be some things in your life that you didn't plan on and that may not be comfortable. In fact, I, I think this is a simple way to say, are you willing to love Jesus so much that you would suffer for him. And we don't often talk about the fact that suffering is a part of the Christian life, that part of following Jesus, that some people will reject you and that may be suffering, that there are some hard things we don't understand. There are things we pray for that don't happen. And you know, it's, it's always hard to me when people say, well, you know, I, 
I still believe in God, but I've given up on his people. I don't go to church anymore. I don't want to be a member. I'm, I, something bad happened at church. And you know what? People get their feelings hurt at church because churches are full of people. And people still have that sin nature, and we still have, usually they say, I've been hurt at church, and I say, me too, let's talk. But see, what, what this is saying is it doesn't matter what people do. What matters is what Jesus has done. And so the question about being a disciple is, what does it take to stop you? What does it take you to make you say, I'm going to drop out, or I'm going to quit, or I don't want to follow Jesus anymore, or I don't know if I believe anymore? And he says, you take up your cross. You're willing to follow me whatever it costs. And then he goes on and he says, I, wa I want you to follow me. And think again who he was talking to. He was talking to these young men who he had called to be part of his little traveling band. He was the rabbi, they were the students. But I think we skip this too quickly. They got to be with Jesus for three years. Like, sit down with him, talk with him. <laughs> he washed their feet. They watched him do miracles, but they just got to hang out with him all the time. And we were talking, a couple of pastors and I were talking this week. It's like, I don't know if we emphasize that enough, that one of the amazing things about having a relationship with Jesus is you have a relationship. It's not just about how to get smarter or do better with your family or, or, or conform to church culture, because I think that sometimes happens we talked about last week, don't be conformed to the world. Don't let the world press you into its mold. But I think there's an equal danger. Don't let the church be just making you behave a church way instead of being a follower, a true follower of Jesus. Because I think there's a lot of cultural Christians who are not really disciples. And there are seekers who are looking to make a decision to follow Christ. And there are disciples who are, disciples who are followers of Jesus. There's not a category in between them that says, I'm kind of a Christian. It's kind of like being kind of pregnant. You either are or you're not. And we have cultural people who get conformed and they learn the words of the church and they learn the behavior and they try to fit in. But they may have never had a heart change that says, I'm a follower of Jesus. And that's a huge and big step. And I, I remember a a man that was coming to church here for a while, and I was doing a series where we were talking about doubts and the fact that doubts are an often a part of our spiritual journey, and we don't understand everything, and we don't have the answers to all the questions that we wished we did. And in that message, I, I stole a phrase I'd read from somebody, and he said, I chose, instead of living in my doubts and visiting my faith, I chose to live in my faith and visit my doubts. And he told me after the service, he said, that's what I needed to hear. I've been letting my doubts stop me from following Jesus. And today I decided to live in my faith and visit my doubts and not the other way around. What does it mean to be a disciple? It means I put myself completely in Christ's hands. That's the picture of baptism. It says I get to be with Jesus. My old life is gone. My new life is now with Jesus. I'm not just working for him. I'm not just going to see him someday when I die, but his spirit comes and lives within me and we actually have the presence of Christ more than you and I are aware of, but we get to live with Jesus. What a, what a privilege, what a call. So the first question, if I'm a disciple, is am I really a follower of Jesus? And then the second part is am I being transformed? Is my life changing? Because if you are following Jesus, if you're being I mean, excuse me, if you are denying yourself, if you are taking up your cross daily, if you are willing to follow Jesus, then the, the process always results in transformation because you can't have Jesus inside of you and stay the same. And so there's this process of growth, and sometimes it's slow and painful, and there's lots of, you know, you think of plants like this, they're so vulnerable, and a little bug can come along and eat them all, they can just get too much sun, they can not have enough water, they, they, they are so vulnerable at this stage. But if there is real life, there will be real change. And what happens when God changes us is there's a process where he begins to change the things we think, change what you believe is true. Because if Jesus really is the only way and if people are really headed to hell without Jesus, then it puts certain things into our lives that we say, this is the most important thing in my life. It begins to change 
what I think of as true, how I understand the world. And that means that it changes my heart. It changes my attitudes. It changes what I care about. It changes the things that are going on inside of me when nobody's looking. And if that happens, then it changes my actions. It changes how I spend my time. It changes how I spend my money. It changes how I relate to people and relationships. And the, the cool part is that you and I get the privilege of helping each other see transformation. You know, it's like when you see somebody's kids that you haven't seen for six months. It's like, whoa, they got taller. And, and you get to see that because you haven't seen them every day. But parents often don't notice. And I think it's the same way in the spiritual journey. Sometimes your, your process is so daily that you, you lose the perspective. And I, and I got to have a fun conversation with, with a young lady here a couple of weeks ago. And she was talking about some struggles that she was going through and things that were going on. And I just was overwhelmed with this sense of, do you understand where you started? Have you forgotten where you came from? And I had not forgotten because, frankly, I would give her about a 2% chance of following Jesus and hanging in there in church and seeing life transformation. It's like, I don't, I don't know if you have the cannot be saved list and cannot be transformed list, but unconsciously I have that list. And I said, let me just take you for a minute back to where you started. And I, in fact, knew how she grew up and who her parents were. And I said, let me tell you what you were like when I first met you. And at that point, she didn't even know if there was a God. Her life was a complete mess. Her marriage was a mess. All of her relationships were a mess. And I got to look her in the eye and I said, do you understand that you are an absolute miracle? And I want you to grab that word instead of saying, I've grown a little bit. Say, I'm a miracle. Because only God could do what's happened in your life. And I think we have a chance to say that for each other and say, look at how it's happened. I see you changing. I see your attitudes are different. I see you never would have done that before. And we get to reflect to each other that transformation. Because sometimes it's, <laughs> it's like this, you know. We wish it was all up and going, but it's up and down. And it's gradual. But God is changing us, and we need to help each other see that. And, and in fact, I think it's really interesting. When Jesus came to those four guys, they were occupational fishermen. So he was coming to them. They threw their nets out in the Sea of Galilee. They, you can still go to the Sea of Galilee, by the way, and get St. Peter's fish if you want to. They still have them there. I think it's probably a little more commercialized than it was in Peter's day. And, and they pulled these nets in, and that's how they lived. And so Jesus said, follow me, and I will take you from being fishermen to being fishers of men. And as I was thinking about that, I thought, isn't it cool that God doesn't change you into a copycat of somebody else? He changes you in line with how he's already been working in you. He takes your personality and your abilities and your experiences, your good and your bad experiences, and somehow he's able to transform them and to make you a unique and powerful person that can tell people about the love of Jesus. That all he's already given you is in line with what he wants for you. That your history tells you something about your destiny. And he's not making you a copy of somebody else. And we get that wrong so easily. Oh, I've got to pray like somebody, somebody or I've got to learn as much Bible as somebody, or I've, I've got to do this like that. No, God wants to make you a beautiful, unique creation of his own. God is amazingly creative. And he, in fact, if you read all these cool Bible stories, rarely does he ever use the same cool thing twice. I mean, there were some, that 10 things with the 10 plagues of Egypt, I'd have used that like every other week. I was like, that was awesome. But he doesn't. He, he keeps making new things that he's doing. So the question is, am I being transformed? Am I letting God do his work in me? Am I trusting him to be the driver even when I desperately want to grab control because it doesn't seem like it's going the way that I want it to go? And then the third question, am I on mission with Jesus? You see, you can't love Jesus, you can't believe that what he says is true and remain unchanged in terms of what he wants us to do in this world. And sometimes we move way too quickly to, here's what we ought to live like, instead of saying, here's who Jesus is, and here's what he's done for me, and here's how he, he comes to live in us and with us. And 
instead of focusing on what we're supposed to do, we, focus, we need to focus on who Jesus is and who we are in Christ. But invariably, that will lead you to care about people differently. It will lead you to want to let them see Jesus in us. And so I was thinking of this verse in uh, John chapter 12 where he says, Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. What's the purpose of a bean? (laughs) The purpose of a bean is to go into the ground and to grow a bean plant so that it can produce many beans. And Jesus said he wants us to be fruitful. He wants our lives to be multiplied so that you and I are impacting the people who are around us And I don't know if you think about this, but the people in your neighborhood, the people you work with, the people you go to school with, do you realize you might be the only one that's praying for them? You might be the only real example of Jesus in their life. And so we're going to challenge you and encourage you to be more bold, to not be ashamed, to not be afraid, to not hold back, but not be obnoxious, but to let people know what Jesus has done in you, that he's transformed you and he is transforming you. And so one of the tools that we've used is bumper stickers. And you know, a bumper sticker, this has been the best idea for letting people know how many people are a part of Family Church. And it's a cool way to just kind of get the word out and we've had people that have come to church because they saw bumper stickers. But you know what I think the important part of it is? Maybe it helps your driving, that might be one important part of it. I think the important part of it is we're challenging people to identify with Jesus, to not be ashamed, to say, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus, and if you hate Jesus, you may hate me. But if you're interested in finding out about Jesus, I'd be interested in talking to you. And so we're going to encourage you, if you don't have a bumper sticker, or if you've got an old and, and messed up one, to put that on again and to say, I'm a follower of Jesus, and see if that doesn't bring conversations. And then we're also going to do something very fun this year. We're going to have hundreds of these signs that we are going to give away as we lead up to Easter. Last three weeks, of, or last two weeks of March, we're going to give them to you. We want to challenge you. On the first of April, we're going to stick them in our yards. And we're going to say, this is what Easter is about. But it's not just a way of saying this is about Jesus. For some of you, this is a big stretch because you're thinking, I don't know what people in my neighborhood would think. That's one way to find out. (laughs) It will prompt some conversations. And you say, well, I never know about those people that put signs for everything. You don't have to put signs for everything. But for some of you, this is a big first step to say, I want people to know that I follow Jesus. This is the most important thing about me. And I'm unashamed of being a follower of Jesus. And it's things like that that don't save anybody, and it may not even bring anybody to church. But you know what? It makes you aware of who you are, and it may start some conversations. I think we also need to say, if I'm a follower of Jesus, I want to be more passionate about it. And I don't mean passion like worked up and just overexcited. What I mean is it needs to come out of our heart, out of a deep sense about how loved I am and how God has changed me. And, you know, when people go through hard, hard situations, I hear again and again, I don't know how people without Jesus do this. So when you have friends that are going through hard situations, what, would you tell, what should you tell them? Let me tell you, I don't know how people get through this without Jesus. If you want me to pray for you, I would be really happy to do that. If you'd let me pray with you right now. I think that's one of the things I would also encourage you to be bold about is when people are telling you what's going on in their lives, just say to them, would you mind if we prayed about that right now? You know, obviously if you're not in a big public place, but if you say, can I pray with you right now? I have never had anybody say no. It's like even if they're not sure they believe in God, it's like, what can it hurt, right? But it gives you a chance to pray over them and prayer is powerful. And so we want as a church to not be a church full of good church people. We want to be a church full of disciples. People who are really trying to follow Jesus the best we can. People who are being transformed. Our lives are changing. We're seeing God at work. And I hope you can look back six months and say, you know, I'm different than I was. 
God is working in me. I've wrestled through some things. I, I've learned some things. I am different than I used to be. And as I told you a couple of weeks ago, people get stuck. We get stuck regularly. The only, the only question is, how long do you stay stuck? And if you get stuck, get off it, that high-centered, whatever it is that's got you stuck. And we need to be passionate. Why? Because it matters. One of the greatest joys of my life is not the size of the church or the people I've led to Christ. It's that my children are following Jesus. And if you're a disciple, the chances of your children becoming disciples go way up. And the chances of your neighbors going way up. One of the greatest joys of my life is to see people that I've known as neighbors who are now followers of Jesus and coming to family church. And I'm telling you, it's scary and it's exciting and it's all up and down. It's messy. But there is nothing better than becoming a disciple of Jesus and helping be part of him drawing other people's other people to become disciples as well. Everything else is secondary to that. So let me encourage you to say, God, I want to be more bold about my faith. I want to be unashamed. And I want to be more passionate. I want, I want the love that I have for God to leak out in my everyday life. And you know what, what's interesting is that the more you love Jesus, the more those things will happen and you won't even know how they happened. How did that come up? I don't know. Why? Because it's on your heart and your mind and Christ is working in you and through you. And so we want to be disciples who follow Jesus. We want to be a church that makes disciples. And I hope that what you're feeling right now is I want to be more of a disciple. We're going to hand off to South Umpqua campus if they have church tomorrow. And to Green Campus, which I'm sure they're going to have church tomorrow. Love you guys. Let me just ask you a quick question, because I think some of these things bring perspective. What if you were to know that Jesus is going to come back in one week? Like he promised. He said, just like I left, I'm going to come back. I know, some of you are thinking, <laughs> I'm not going to file my taxes. <laughs> I'm not going to finish my homework. But on a more serious level, if you only had one week left, what would you do differently? And I don't mean that to be a, a threat. I just think it helps you remember and realize that we get so focused on things that don't matter and don't last, and we neglect things that are ultimately the most important things. And I am very sure that if we knew Jesus was coming back in a week, we would all live differently. And the whole purpose of Jesus saying, I'm coming back and not telling us when, is to give that sense of urgency. Not a crazy sense of urgency where you sell everything and go sit on a hilltop, but a real sense of this week I want to do what's, what's important and what matters. And I want to challenge you this week to be thinking about where is it that God wants me to deny myself? and to put him first instead of me first. And I assure you, if you pray for that, the Holy Spirit will put his finger in your heart and say, how about here? And just say, okay. Let him drive, because he's a better driver. Father, thank you for the scripture that challenges us and makes us think deeply. And I can't imagine, Jesus, when you look that big group of followers or people that were crowding around you and you looked them in the eye and you said, you have to take up your cross if you want to follow me. And I'm sure some of them left and missed out. But those that decided to lose their life for you, they found life. And they found life eternal, not just after they die, but every day. So God, help us to be full-on followers of yours. Help us to be transformed by you, to surrender to you, to let you work in us, and help us to be more honest and passionate with the people who are around us so that we can lean in and have those conversations for the people that we're praying for. And we trust, God, that you will do what we cannot do, and that is bring people to yourself. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, 
And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can... Uh, Give us some feedback. We'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.